This is ThinkTech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is The Ties That Bind. And today, we are going to talk about the civil rights movement and my dear friend. Of course, everybody knows I only talk to dear friends. So this is Reggie Robinson, and he is going to tell us all kinds of tales from the civil rights movement. And <laughs> Reggie was, I quote, the advance man, how about that, the advance man for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And he's going to tell us what an advance man is and does and did. Reggie, welcome. Hello there. Hi. Welcome, Hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so glad to talk to you. Well, always glad to talk to you. Now, Reggie and I go back. We were trying to decide how far back, but it's a long time. Uh, 1950 something, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Right. We were in yeah. an organization called the Civic Interest Group, which was a precursor to SNCC. So, SNCC is the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And I'm not sure how it began, but Juanita Mitchell, which we'll talk about later, uh, she was the adult in the group. And she was an attorney and had been fighting for desegregation in Baltimore all of her life. And so she was one of the creators of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And Reggie and I were students. And so, Reggie, tell us about the time that we spent with, this, with the CIG. Well, it was the late 50s, and I lived in East Baltimore, Marsha lived in West Baltimore, and I was attending at the time a small business college known as Cortez Peters Business College. It was put together by a man, by a black man who could type 150 words a minute. Wow. And he got some money from uh, one of the typing companies, either Royal or, or Underwood, and, and established three schools. Well, I had a cousin that graduated from, from Cortez. And being that I was on the streets doing a little bit of everything, <laughs> she, she kind of convinced me that it was time to maybe pull the reins in and kind of convinced my dad that uh, he'd give me another chance at it. <laughs> so, my, so my father supported me and my cousin helped me, so I got into the Civic, got into a Cortez Peters. There I met Walter Dixon, who is the dean of, um, of uh, Cortez in Baltimore. And he was also the first black city councilman in Baltimore. And at the time he had a public accommodations bill going on in Baltimore, but let me go back a little bit. Before this, in Greensboro, North Carolina, four guys from E&T sat in at the Woolworth, which started to spread the word across the South to other colleges around to uh, do the same thing. And then they began to sit in and it was beginning to organize, uh, uh, it was, a, it was not an organized situation at the time, but then it was cited by a lady by the name of Ella Baker, who was working for, at that time, Martin Luther King. He was, she was his executive secretary. And it was the efforts of Mrs. Baker and her contacts, such as Miss Mitchell in Baltimore, that pulled together other adults around the country 
to help the students to begin to pull together what is known as the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, of which the CIG became a part of this, the, the Coordinating Committee. Well, I messed around and got to be the first logistical coordinator where we would go and uh, and close down restaurants in, in Baltimore. <laughs> we had two Renaults. Marsha owned one of them, and a kid, another guy named Tony, Tony Adana owned the other. And what we had to do was go to all of the restaurants downtown Baltimore at a precise time, jump out the Renault, run into the restaurant, sit down at the, at the counter, police come in, read the remainder, we get up, run out, go close down another restaurant until we've done that enough times in the, in the uh, area to confuse and, 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 and the restaurant association came to agreement to serve us. Well, let's go back well, one step. Was, Let me go back one step. Yeah. Now, yeah. the Protestant churches gave us room at for offices in the basement of the church. Right. And it was the women's job to do the typing, answer the phone, and do the mimeograph machine. That was it. And my job, because we knew where we were going, I would call the Baltimore Sun and say, you know those little colored children are going to have a demonstration at wherever it was, and then we'd make sure the press was there. So that was my job. Now, we get in the car and finish your trip. Reggie, back to you. Uh -huh. <laughs> so then we would, um, so that was one of the logistical things is putting together how are you going to run into this uh, precisely at lunchtime and get out and not get elect not get arrested? Well, you could get arrested if you wanted to, and it would hold it over for 29 or 49 days for publicity reasons. But then we would bail you out. Yeah. But then I became then then the organization began to grow, and then their monies become in because we we had this group of adults that uh, back us up, like a couple of ministers, a couple of <laughs> other people in the neighborhood. Uh, uh, well, I can say a man by the name of Mr. Willie Adams and, and a few other people. They gave us money, so that money had to be accounted for. So I was again put forward to, because I knew a little bit about accounting, I was made the treasurer of the organization. Well, it came around a time when the representative Snick Wheaton was going to be in Kentucky in July. And a representative of Snick had to be chosen because Clarence Mitchell Jr., who was the former representative to the big Snick, but now had to step down for family reasons. And we had also started our voter registration project at that time, of which <laughs> when we started out, we did not know people was making money in this voter registration project until a man by the name of Mr. Troy Braley. Oh, I remember Troy. Who just, who just happened to be a very good friend of Marsha's mama, Miss Elizabeth Oliver. And Mr. Troy Braley was from the unions. And he was involved in this strategy to do this voter registration to get this person electric, elected, which happened to be Clarence Mitchell, Mitchell Jr. Jr. Yeah. Well, well anyway. Yeah, let, me, let me pause right here. Yeah. One, one of the things that doesn't get talked about is what is going on underneath. Now, people see all of the pictures of the marches and the demonstrations and all of this stuff. But underneath, mm -hmm. underneath that, there was a major, major push to get everybody registered to vote because that is the only way you make change. So 
Uh, true. So now we true. Can, so that, that people understand what you're talking about when you go talk about registering to vote. Well, that's that's about the same time that SNCC was was starting to think about moving away from direct action, which was the bus stops and the lunch counters, and going directly into direct action, and going into the deep south. Well, anyway, the meeting, we now had the meeting in, in Kentucky in 61, and I've been elected to represent the, the Baltimore group to the SNCC, to the big SNCC. <laughs> and I got, a, I got an assignment to bring the next SNCC meeting back to Baltimore and to, um, what was it, some else we'll bring the next stick meeting back to Baltimore and, and get, in, and make sure that King was, make sure that King was going to come with the group because nobody around Baltimore had seen any of these people that had been talked about in the student voice or in the Afro or anywhere else. So we were trying to boost what was happening in Baltimore. Well, before I left, I was the treasurer, as I said. I had to take care of the books. I had to buy the, uh, the supplies. I had to uh, make sure that the telephone bill was paid. I had to make sure that folks had gas. Yeah, that, all of those yes, kind of all things. those kind of things. <laughs> <laughs> came, came before the, the, the hallelujah. <laughs> But anyway, I went on down to, um, to Kentucky in 61 to the meeting. I had, a, I had a patch on my eye from a party where I got oh, hit in the eye with okay. a breath balloon. I wasn't on the line. <laughs> oh, I, but, don't, I was going to say, I don't uh, remember this. Yeah. But, it helped, but it helped when I sat down with all of these freedom riders who had been injured in one way or another. But... I came in and I sat with these folks who were familiar to me by name, but I didn't date. And I hadn't met them yet. And then we went to, on Saturday evening, we went to Ann Braden's house, who was head of SCIF, who was really hosting what was happening in, in, um, in Kentucky at that time and, and supporting most of the meetings. But anyway, I met Ella Baker for the first time on that porch, even though I'd met her in a meeting. But she said to me, you look like somebody I know. <laughs> and I said, I do. She said, yeah, and who's your people? And I told her who my father was. And she said, no, that's not it. She says, where's your mama from? I said, Littleton, North Carolina. She says, uh-huh. She says, what's your mama's maiden name? I said, Jenkins. And she says, oh, you're, you're uh, Roosevelt. I said, no, you're McKinley. I says, McKinley? I said, no, I got, an, I got an Uncle McKinley in New York. She says, I know, and you look just like him. And I said, oh, my God, who is this woman? <laughs> and so then she began to tell me how her and my mama grew up together and my mama and her family. And so then she introduced me to Chuck McDew and Charles Sherrod and and, and Tim Jenkins and everybody else. And by the time it came around to voting where the next meeting was, I had the next meeting coming to Baltimore. Oh, great. <laughs> well, by the time that happened, um, we, we, went, we were going to have a big meeting because we'd also convince King. Well, King was trying to stop us from going in because he says that if we were going into these black belt counties, we were going to get killed, and there was no question about it. And it was definitely we weren't going to do it. And we were telling him, <laughs> in so many words, go preach. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> so so we went on and had the meeting in Baltimore. And went, oh, 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 one of the logistical things that happened again was we had a big mass meeting because King was coming to town. And we had the big, you remember the big Masonic Hall? Yes. And on, on, on Utah Place. And we had that place packed. So what I suggested was that most of the time these Baptist ministers like to get the collection in the middle of things. Why don't we collect it up 
at up the front. beginning of things. So we got the money. So by the time Y.T. Walker got up in the middle of the, of the program to make the collection, somebody pulled him on a coattail and told him we got the money and gone. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, Y.T. didn't like me too much, but uh, he, he offered me a job when I met him in Atlanta. Uh huh. But anyway, he was I a went sharp. He there. was. He was. Talk about logistics. The man was really sharp. Yes, he was. And so from from so so then I was asked because we had registered so many people in Baltimore. That was the other thing I reported in in Kentucky that we had registered this great number of people in Baltimore. So I became a voter registration expert as they thought. So <laughs> so they 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 asked me if I wanted to go to Mississippi. I said, I ain't doing nothing, yeah, I'll go. Now this was and which what, summer? This 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 is sixty one. Sixty one. Okay. This is now this is now August sixty one. Well, July sixty one, late July. Mm hmm. And I get to Macomb, Mississippi, and I meet Bob Moses, and the first thing he tells me is that we have to set up a freedom school. We have to set up. Housing for other other people coming in. We gotta make arrangements with the local grocers and and the restaurant folk, and we've got to have some way to count the monies that's coming in and donations. Somebody's got to do all of that, and, I, and somebody's got to go down and open up uh, accounts in the in the local stores, like the uh, especially the office supply store. Where we had to get supplies for the school and and, and placards and stuff, and the bank we had to open up a bank account. We were doing business with the city, and the city didn't even know who the hell we were. <laughs> but um, and, and so just those kinds of things were were the, were the hard part of putting together. The rest, when we had a rally, uh, folks would sing and shout. And then if we got somebody to go on recruitment to to go to the school first, you had to go to school in order to register to vote. Because in 61 in, in, in Mississippi, you had to interpret the Constitution of the Mississippi in and, order to register to vote. You and had to, pay, you had to and interpret it. And pay the it. poll tax, yes. And, and pay the poll tax. You had to interpret it and write it. So folks had to learn to read and write. So we had to teach people who had never learned to read and write to even have the courage to go down and register to vote. And while this is happening, there's a man by the name of Herbert Lee who was um, an NAACP representative, but he was working with us. And that was a good thing about us in, in Mississippi and, and, and wherever we worked. We didn't pay no attention to who you were. If you were coming to help us out, we didn't care, even if they were the FBI, if they wanted to. <laughs> and they did. To, to, and they did. Listen, they, well, Reggie. They did, and we didn't ask them, we didn't ask them their name, but uh, they, they probably registered they, some votes. They did. Too. Listen, sweetheart, but, um, we need to take a break. So we'll be yeah. in 30, 60 seconds. We will be right back and pick up the story right there. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Hi, I'm Bill Sharp, host of the Asian Review here on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss, and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. Aloha, welcome to Hawaii. This is Prince Dykes, your host of the Prince of Investing, coming to you guys each and every Tuesday at 11 a.m. right here on Think Tech Hawaii. Don't forget to come by and check out some of the great information on stocks, investing, your money, all the other great stuff, and I'll be your host. See you Tuesday. Hi, I'm Marcia, and we're talking 
to Reggie Robinson, and he was the front man going into the South during the Civil Rights Movement. And Reggie was telling us about Herbert Lee, and he, yeah, Herb. Go ahead. No, go ahead. You finish. No, I'm I'm saying there's so many stories to tell. I don't even know where to begin. So continue. Well, Herbert Lee, as I was saying, was a representative of the NAACP, and he was working with us. And State Representative Hurst, and he was a state representative, came in the cotton gin and shot him dead. Ooh. Um, just because he was registering to vote with us, helping us to get people to register to vote, and he was, he was a registered voter himself. And we were told that we were not to leave, we were not to, we were to leave town and not to even go to his funeral or anything. And Amzie Moore, who was one of the important people who brought us into Mississippi, told us that if we were left then, we could never do it, we could never do anything again. So we held a rally in Amy County at his funeral, and so that took care of that, and we stayed and did what we had to do. Well, other places that I've been was, uh, so like Selma, Alabama. I was on a mission for Ruby Doris, who was the boss at that time. She used to operate out of Atlanta, telling us what to do and where to go and, and keeping track of us on the watch line. I was traveling back to Atlanta getting ready for a conference. I was stopping at all of the black campuses, talking up the uh, conference that was coming up to get as many participants as we could. I got back to Atlanta. We had a message from Selma, Alabama, that somebody wanted to talk to us on Selma University. So I was moved out to Selma, Alabama to talk to, I think I remember his name, a young Reverend Johnson that was living on Selma's campus. He was in school there. And I was smuggled on campus and I stayed on campus for about two weeks, putting together contacts in the neighborhood, uh, looking at the town and trying to figure out what it was all about, who, who owned what and, and um, who was the biggest employers and where the money's come from. And, and places for people to stay, and then when I got, then I got discovered, so I had to leave town just at the conference, and after the conference, it was decided that Bernard Lafayette would go into Selma and complete what, what I had started, because we had found a group of ministers there, by, we, we, we dubbed them the 12 high. And so Bernie went in, Bernie went in to uh, operate with them. And that's how the Selma project got started, which led on to whatever you wanted to see about uh, oh. Lawrence County. Oh, yeah. Uh, everybody knows they heard of Stokely Carmichael. Stokely was a part of SNCC. He was one of the chairs, right? Yes, he was. Yeah. And he was in, went into Lowndes County to, just like you, to register people to vote. And what he ran into, of course, was the economy that if these people went to vote, they were pushed off the plantation. And he helped to work that, that the skills they had in, in creating quilting and other things, that he managed to figure out a way for them to sell in Chicago and other places. But the big thing was to get them registered to vote. And they were told that they couldn't be on the ballot without a symbol, like everybody's got a logo on the ballot. And what he told me is that he saw this high school football team with the Black Panther. And that was how he decided to use that 
Black Panther as the symbol on the ballot so that these black people could A, have a candidate and could, could vote. So that's as fast as I can put it together, <laughs> real fast. But Lowndes County mm -hmm. was horrible, nasty place, and even all these years later, it's still, you can feel the ghost in Lowndes County. You can feel it, you can see it, it's, they're just there. It's an awful place. But Mississippi, Alabama, oh my God. How you survived Mississippi was a hellhole. Reggie. Yeah. So how what long? What was the question? No, I'm saying how long were you in Mississippi? Well, let's put it this way: I was with Snake for six years. I was only I was only in Mississippi that time from July to maybe December. Then I came back to Mississippi some years back in, again, other times, because I began to move around. Um, the last time I was in Mississippi was from 66 to 67. No, from 67 to 68. Yeah. Now you were and in Cambridge. Time I, you were in Cambridge, Maryland. Uh, also, right? Yes, I was. Yes, I was. Tell us about Cambridge, that. Maryland. was an awful, awful time. Well, I had left, we had left Mississippi, we had left Mississippi to regroup after the students had walked out of school in, in, uh, in Macomb, and we regrouped in, in Atlanta. And it was suggested that that regrouping that I go back to Route 40, which was up in Maryland, and coordinate with a guy by the name of Robert Carter, who was working for CORE, who was working on the Route 40 uh, project. And I was to coordinate that with him. And in the meantime, while I'm working there in, in, in Maryland, uh, it's Christmas time, and I get a call from Ruby saying that five students from New York is sitting in the core office getting ready to go to Cambridge, Maryland, getting ready to go to Critchfield, Maryland. And they, they've never had any nonviolent training or whatever. They were just going. And so she said, get over there and check it out. So by the time I finished talking to him and everything, I was on a bus to Critchfield, Maryland. One of the first times I only got, the only time I got locked up, the <laughs> whole six years I worked for SNCC, even though I was in and out of jail, okay. checking on other folks. I never, I never, this was the only time I really got an arrest. But we went to this restaurant that was owned by then Governor Torres in uh, Chrisville, Maryland, and we got out of, we, we, we were in Princess Anne, Maryland, and Fred Sinclair from Cambridge, Maryland, was our bail bondsman, Miss <laughs> Mitchell had found Yeah, him. Reggie. And Fred, yeah. Hurry, get arrested because we have one minute left. <laughs> well, Cambridge became a hot spot. And there again, it was necessary almost a year before our folks uh, could leave town and the local folks took over. That meant taking care of money again and finding places for folks to live and just the general upkeep and discipline of folks and anything you can imagine other than standing in front of the flag and shouting hallelujah. Well, listen, sweetheart, you will have to come back and finish telling us all the six years of stories. And it's been a real pleasure talking to you, as always. And you will come back. Okay. All you right. Promise me I you will. What you want promise me you'll okay. come back and finish telling us the story. Thank you so right, much. Anytime you want. Thank you. Okay. Aloha. Right now.